Hello, welcome back everyone. Okay, so um, we have uh, Sarah Lambert. Sarah is the family member of a person with BPD and a therapeutic counseling Hello, student. Welcome back, everyone. Is it echoing? Oh no. Oh, wait, sorry, my phone was on, that's why. Let's start again. <laughs> we are having a little bit of echoing difficulties and trying to make this work. Okay. Welcome Sarah Lambert. Sarah is the family member of a person with BPD and a therapeutic counseling student. Her sister's journey with BPD was marked by many coping difficulties, including interpersonal conflicts, chronic pain, self-harming behaviors, and substance use. The struggle was further exacerbated by the challenge to obtain professional help in public and private settings, including access to DBT services, counseling, and psychiatry. Unfortunately, Becky was not able to get the help she needed, and her story's tragic ending is a serious reminder of the urgent need for support in the community and the impact one person has on us all. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks, Bailey. Thank you for having me, yeah. and thank you for everyone listening today. Um, as Bailey mentioned, I'm going to be sharing a bit about my sister's story, as well as my own experience uh, supporting a loved one with BPD. Um, I know that this can be uh, really challenging at times. It brings up a lot of emotions. Um, it can make us feel really disoriented and helpless. And so I'm hoping that there's pieces of my story that will resonate with some of the loved ones that are listening in today and, and to let you know as well that you're not alone in feeling that. It's it's um, it's a very rare, rare difficulty. So i um, glad that you're listening. I'm glad that you're here. Um, Bailey, maybe if you could just share the first photo that I sent to you, we can give everyone a little um, introduction to Becky. Yeah, for sure. Okay. <laughs> so there's Baxter as a kid in the front and center and I love this photo because it just shows how goofy she was like she was such a happy free-spirited kid and um, you know, you can also see that we are very close as a family. There's my mom and my sister there. And my dad's not in this photo because of course he was the one taking it, but we did lots of family trips together and um, we had lots of fun. So we were very lucky to be very close. Um, but Becky was always kind of a little bit of an offbeat kid. My parents would say that she beat to her own drum and she always, sort of had a hard time feeling like she fit in anywhere. She, you know, she didn't really fit in with the, the main groups at school. She didn't really fit in with the mainstream um, education system. And so that was always kind of hard for her feeling like she didn't really have a place and have a voice. So um, that was kind of a challenge that she started facing really early on. And um, thanks, Bailey, if you can pull that down now. Um, so she, she was, you know, always looking for people to connect with. She was super empathic and super sensitive. And so she was always helping out, like volunteering. She was, you know, working for different nonprofit organizations and trying to help animals. She was, you know, that empathic side was definitely um, always showing up in her. But I think also being so sensitive made her an easy target. And so she was like bullied quite aggressively in the school years. And the way that she coped with that was she started um, like calorie counting, managing her eating. And I think this is like, this is something that I wanted to mention because I know so often we can see these co-occurring um, issues with BPD. And I think that was one kind of one of the first, when I think back, that's one of the first signs that Becky was really struggling is that she was um, using food to gain a sense of control over her life or to distract from the struggles that were going on. Um, so, you know, she would only eat a certain number of calories per day or have to burn a certain number on the elliptical machine at the gym. And she would weigh herself um, every day and like write it in a calendar and these types of things. And uh, what, you know, I think what happens so often, whether it's with disordered eating or BPD or any, um, 
any of these symptoms and behaviors that are seen is that people will focus in on that, the problematic behavior and not what is at the core of the issue. So Becky was really struggling with being bullied. She was really struggling with self-esteem. She was struggling with needing a sense of control over her life. And so she took to this um, eating management to do that. Um, and then, you know, fast forward a couple of years and getting into the teenage years, she started going out to parties and having a few drinks, but then that started to get more and more excessive. And she was making bad decisions. We were, we couldn't, you know, there was definitely some impulsivity there, but it was hard to tell if that was a behavioral trait or if that was just a result of, um, you know, lifestyle choices. And so uh, at the age of 18 was the first time we got a phone call from Becky at midnight and she was calling to tell us that she had drank an entire Mickey of vodka and had swallowed an entire bottle of ibuprofen and subsequently panicked and also called an ambulance and so uh you know I remember hearing that news and like falling to my knees I was in so much pain from you know the like I guess it was I was afraid and I was sad that that was where she was at and so, uh, you know, we went to meet her at the hospital. We were very scared. And unfortunately, it was not the first time. There were many, many hospital visits that followed. And it took several more years and multiple suicide attempts or suicidal gestures for Becky to actually be diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. And I know that's come up quite a bit today, Bailey, um, in trying to get earlier diagnosis and the pros and cons of that. And so it really was a relief because on the one hand, we felt like, okay, we had more information to get access to the right services. And Becky felt like, okay, you know, there's not just something wrong with me. Like, you know, this is, this is a real thing. And there's other people that are going through this. And there's a reason that these things are happening for me. But on the other hand, it was very stigmatizing and it made her also feel very, um, I mean, depressed, there's no other real <laughs> word to describe it. it the, the label threw her into a really bad place. And so at that point, um, she had a hard time leaving her room. She was, um, you know, she was just crying all the time, had no energy and was engaging in a variety of self harming behaviors. And <clears throat> um, she would, you know, she would not eat for a couple of days at a time and was said that she was trying to starve herself to death. Um, she was cutting and, you know, engaging in other more violent uh, suicidal gestures. So this was <laughs> very, very hard to know how to be supportive of. Um, you know, she would, she would, she tried to get into a DBT program. And of course there's difficulty in accessing that, but also she wasn't stable enough to show up for a meeting every single day or for, for certain appointment times because she was, you know, sleeping all sorts of different hours. And so there was huge barriers for her and being able to get, to get the right help. Um, so many, many times when she was feeling unsafe or we were feeling that we couldn't keep her safe, she would go to psychiatric emergency and they would always discharge her within a day or two. And I remember my mom begged them to admit her to a ward. She, she went down there and she said, I can't keep this person safe. I am not equipped to help this person. I'm afraid for her life. I'm afraid to leave the house. And they basically said that there's nothing that they can do. And I don't know, like if, if someone's mother, the one person on the planet who is job is to protect someone and keep them safe is saying, I, I need help. You know, I don't know what else, what else it should take. So um, it, it was, it was a constant struggle. 
And um, at that time I was living in Vancouver. So away, my family's in Victoria. So I was away from the family at that time. And I was really struggling with um, not knowing how to be supportive from afar, feeling also very helpless. And so that was starting to take a toll on my mental health as well. I was getting depressed. I was having trouble sleeping and I was feeling really guilty for not being able to be around more. You know, I would try to talk to Becky on the phone, but again, with having different hours, that kind of thing. And I was a lot, I had a lot of anger coming up. Um, I think because of my fear and because of, of seeing the pain that, that both my mom and my sister were in. And so I remember Becky called me one time, not too long after one of her suicide attempts. And I lashed out at her. I was like, why are you doing this? Like, what are you trying to do? Do you have any idea what you're putting our mom through? Like I was, I was totally freaking out. <laughs> and it was, you know, that's obviously not what she needed to hear. She needed support. She needed a caring. She didn't need me to be judgmental. And um, I'm not proud of that conversation. But I also realized at that time that like something needed to change. You know, I wasn't, I couldn't, we couldn't keep going the way things were going. And so I scheduled um, an appointment with a counselor for myself to try and to try and address some of my anger that was coming up as a result of this. And when I went to this counselor, he suggested an experimental shock therapy treatment for Becky. And he didn't do anything to address like what I was going through or what our family was going through. And so it was totally like, it made me angrier actually, because I was like, I'm here to talk to you about my struggle. And I didn't, I didn't get any help. So, um, (laughs) and that sounds, it sounds selfish to say that out loud. Like when my sister is over here going like through so much and I'm like, I think it it makes sense. I think it makes perfect sense that you wanted the support and it it sounds, yeah. Thank you. Wow. And (laughs) I wanted to share that because I think that, you know, if there are loved ones listening today, that that is a very real concern, you know, caregiver burnout is, is a serious issue. And so, you know, we need to, we do need to also take steps to look after, ourselves and recognize when we're not doing well because we can't help anyone else if we're struggling ourselves so um yeah um and so after that i continued searching for help and searching for i mean (laughs) i was in problem solving mode i was like how do i help fix my sister and at that moment uh was when i found that family connections program and so that is um it's a skills program for loved ones of those suffering from emotional regulation issues. And so it is rooted in DBT skills, which is great because uh, then you kind of have a shared language. So this, the program that I took is, is designed for family members and loved ones. But then I also had a better understanding of some of the training that, that Becky was going through. Um, and it did help to improve our communication and it helped to reduce some of the anger that I was experiencing. And then a few years later, the BPD Society did bring that program to Victoria and we were able to attend as a family. And I know that that as well, um, Becky said that she was really happy that we had gone to it and it really showed that we were making an effort to be supportive of her and to learn more about what she's going through. So um, that was like a positive moment in the story (laughs) but um you know i guess at that same time becky was also she was starting to stabilize in her experience like she had quit drinking she was going to 12-step meetings she was attending the bpd society's support group um and she was also working through the dbt workbook so she was getting a lot of help but she also um she had been on all, you know, many different prescription medications to try and stabilize her mood levels. And um, at one point, you know, they they had her on 40 milligrams of Valium, which is like the maximum dose for a full grown man. And, you know, Becky is like a tiny little, like hundred pound girl. And so she was like a zombie 
zombie. Like she couldn't, you know, she didn't have the energy to really do anything. She, her whole life was just monotone and she wasn't enjoying it. Like she was just, she was going through the motions. And, um, you know, she had tried to, she also tried to get into detox and stabilization. She looked into private programs to get off, um, to get off these prescription medications because she just want, or at least to reduce them. Um, cause she just like, she couldn't carry on the way things were. And so eventually she, she decided that she wanted a medically assisted suicide and she wanted our family's support in going through with that. And of course, like at this point, my anger was like back up to here because there's, you know, I told her flat out, there's absolutely no way that our family is going to support you in doing that. Like it's it's infuriating that you would even ask ask that of us and you know the the point that i was missing at the time of course was not that she wanted actually wanted to die i don't th i don't believe that she actually wanted to die i think that she just wanted to escape the pain that she was in like she didn't want to carry on with these medications but she also felt really hopeless to get off them and felt hopeless to like live a normal life. So, you know, she kept the idea of suicide in her back pocket as an escape. It just, it just felt like it was always nice to have an idea that there's another way out kind of thing. Um, and then I guess it was around this time last year and when COVID was hitting, and I know Bailey, you've brought up a couple times today, you know, the impact of COVID on individuals with BPD, there's not really evidence yet of research you know, suggesting the impacts. But I, I know from experience that Becky had a really hard time whenever her routines were were thrown off. You know, she struggled at Christmas and, and Easter holidays and things like that when, you know, the gym was closed or she couldn't go get her groceries when she wanted to and all of these things that kept her in a sense of security of having, like, she was grounded by these activities. So those were thrown right out the window. And, you know... Every single person has experienced, you know, anxiety, depression, uh, all sorts of mood issues as a result of COVID. And if you extrapolate that to someone who has a heightened uh, sensitivity and heightened reactivity, well, I, I think that most certainly it would feel like extreme going through that. So I know that she struggled quite a lot. During that time, um, a lot of the meetings that she wanted to go to, like support meetings and that, were either not happening or transitioning to online. And again, it's difficult to to get the same effect from those things when you're connecting through a screen and you don't get to have the small talk before and after and that sense of community. And we're all still doing our best to stay connected. But um, in early days, it was certainly very, very challenging. And... Uh, at that same time, Becky decided that she wanted to go cold turkey off of her medications, which was against the recommendation of the psychiatrist. But um, she had recommended a tapering schedule that was going to take, I think, a year to complete. And Becky didn't want to wait that long. So she stopped taking her medications and she basically also stopped sleeping because it was an anti-anxiety medication. So she would just lay in her bed for days, you know, not sleeping and then not having the energy to do anything else. She wasn't eating. Um, and then finally she, one day she did get up and she left the house and she never came back. And that night the police came to knock on her door to tell us that she was gone. They told us that she had taken her own life. And of course, like I couldn't believe it. It was like, I was in such a, such a state of shock. And, you know, I asked them, are, like, are you sure? And I, and I don't know if I like, I, I thought maybe she was in a coma or like the, they, I wasn't sure they, they had the right person. Like I, I couldn't compute. And they said, Rebecca is in the morgue at the Jubilee hospital. And it's, 
it's still hard to comprehend sometimes. Like the other day I picked up my phone to try and call her, but she is, she is gone. And, um, you know, I'm happy that you're, you had me here today to share this story because so many times Becky was looking for help and people labeled her behavior as, you know, attention seeking or would say it's just a cry for help. And the thing is that it, it is a cry for help, but it's one that needs to be listened to because you can't, you can't go back and do it over again. You, you know, you have to fight while they're still here. So it's, it's very serious and, and it needs to be taken seriously. Wow. Thank you, Sarah. Um, it's an incredible, incredibly heartbreaking story. I mean, I obviously knew Becky and, um, you know, she was, like you said, she was very passionate and, um, bright and uh um you know she was uh, i called considered her a friend and um yeah it's really hard to lose someone and i can't imagine i i am not in your position so i can only begin to imagine what you're experiencing um and i do think it's important to share your story um you know uh there are many you know, there we want to share that there are many positive traits of BPD and that there's hope and that there's recovery. But I think it's also important to highlight the realities, you know, that the um, rates of suicide for BPD is um, one in 10 and that um, uh, that, uh, you know, that the pain that people deal with with BVD is really real and that stigma is a huge part of um, that pain and uh, inaccessibility of services um, is also a really real part of um, our story and that, you know, um, that's a, a one of, I think, the contributing factors to mortality in BVD, so. Yeah. Thanks, Kaylee. Thanks. I'm um, just going to see here. Um, is there something that you would like family members new to this journey or still struggling to know? Um, or what support or information did you need as a family member that was not available to you? Well, I'm very happy that you are doing the session after this on ways to support a loved one with BPD because as I, you know, as I went along my journey, I think I I did learn better ways. You know, I didn't I didn't know what validation was. I didn't, you know, I thought I was a good listener, but I learned that I probably wasn't and I learned um you know, the importance of managing our own emotional state in being effective in communicating with someone with BPD. And uh, so there's a, there are a lot of skills that can be very useful and there are definitely ways to access them. And I know that you are making those available through the BPD Society. So um, there's help out there. And, and as I mentioned, you know, it, there's, it's important to consider how we can be effective in supporting our person. And it's also very important to look out for ourselves and to manage our own self-care. And that doesn't necessarily mean going to counseling. It can be you know, our own, our own self-care rituals or, um, you know, setting healthy boundaries. There's a lot of ways to address that, but we also do need to be mindful of, of where we're at. Yeah. And I think that's, um, definitely the suggestion that we give to family members is learning as many tools that you can in your toolbox, like whether that be validation or taking the family connections course, but also as my mom says, you know, it's really important to take care of yourself too. And, um, because it's hard to be, you know, um, at, you know, have all the spoons, um, as we say, um, when you're not taking care of yourself first. So, um, I think that's great information. Um, is there, um, any, uh, uh, links that you would like to share with us about, uh, anything that you're doing in the future? Um, uh, cause I know that you're 
currently uh, a therapeutic counseling student. Did you want to share more about what you're um, doing uh, now or in the future? Um, I, I, yes, I am in school to become a counselor and um, I don't have anything specific to, to DBT that I can announce, but of course, um, the a general, like for, for yourself, like for yourself as a, a counselor, like what exciting things do you have coming up in the future for yourself? You'd like to yeah. Share? So the, the program, um, I'm still working on that will be going until the end of this year. And, um, and then I'll be working predominantly in private practice coming up next year. I don't, um, I don't have any specific projects on the horizon. I'm just focusing on my schoolwork right now and um, being integrated in the community, so. And is there anyone, anywhere that anyone could find you if, if they were looking to um, connect with you further or? Yeah, I do. I have just started an Instagram page. It's uh, at the.conscious.counselor. Uh, was there anything that you wanted to share that we didn't touch on yet or um, that you'd like to add before we go into the Q&A? Um, you know what? I just found this quote recently that I, I'll leave you with because I thought it was so it was so appropriate. Um, it's a, it says, replace att attention seeking with the term support seeking and see how it changes your response to people talking about their mental health. That's great. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've, I've heard of that um, term recently, uh, support seeking or help seeking. And um, I really like that, that term that, that just even that shift in language, you know, there's so many labels around people with BPD. And um, I appreciate that you mentioned some of them. And I think the stigma is still really huge, um, especially within the hospital systems. And just even changing some of that language um, can really change the, the uh, dialogue or demeanor or interaction between, um, you know, whether it be a family member or mental health practitioner with somebody. So, yeah, it's amazing the power of the words that we use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, did you want me to share the other photo? Oh, yes. I did forget about the other photo. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, so, this is a um, Another photo that we have of just a more recent photo of Becky. All right. <laughs> oh, Benjamin. <laughs> she was most herself when she had her blue hair. You can it just I think that's such a beautiful photo that showcases how um, how beautiful she is. <laughs> Yeah, it really makes her eyes pop, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Great. All right. Well, um, we have a few minutes for um, questions. If anybody has some, we ha um, we've had some comments um, along the way. I don't know. Um, can I mention that. Um, Doran mentioned, that is definitely one of the tools I use to try, just one more time, the knowledge that I may not destroy myself today. But there is comfort in knowing that it was always an option. So that was um, from one of the comments you made earlier. Um, Sherry says, I'm so, in capital, sorry for your loss. My condolences with a uh, heart. Um, Deb says, I remember when I heard that we'd lost Becky, it was heartbreaking. I can't imagine what you and your family went through and continue to go through. Doran also says, I found myself looking into an impenetrable darkness within which no light can shine. BPDers experience a whole other level of hopelessness. Charlene gives a heart. Linda says, Sarah, Linda, Gander says, Sarah, you were very brave in telling Becky's story. She was so blessed to have you in her life, and my heart goes out to you and your family heart. Chantel Gander says, I have BPD, and DBT really helps me with my communication. So that was some feedback. Thank um, you. Yeah. And um, so we have... Uh, we're just at the end of time. If anyone has any last questions or comments before we end off the night, before we end off the 
um, the interview. Um, we have we have one more session for the day. Um, we will be doing our annual um, orchid tree. Just want to, of course, right when I t take it down and need it. Um, just one moment. Just want to make sure that I'm getting the correct wording. Um, um, basically, we take um, little orchids and um, we will say like, what is the best way to, we have a different question every year, but this year is what is the best way to support a person um, uh, what is the best way to support folks living with BPD? And then we'll ask people on Facebook Live, and then um, we will write it down, and we will make an orchid tree. <laughs> and so, and then we'll at the end, it looks like a whole bunch of beautiful orchids on a tree. So, anyways, that's coming up next. That's at six till six thirty, and that will um, close off our event for. Um, for the day. So if you'd like to join us for that, because it's interactive and we do need folks for that. So yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, thank you so much, Sarah. And um, I really do appreciate you sh uh, sharing vulnerably with us. I know that it uh, it can never, you know, get, get any easier to bring up these conversations. Um, and uh, I, I appreciate your time and I wish you the best of luck and your um, continued studies. I know for me, um, you know, I think that I bring uh, a valued piece in having, you know, a lived experience that I bring to my counseling practice. So, yeah. Thank you, Bailey. Thanks so much.